Shalom. Welcome to another episode of Inspiration from Zion. I'm Jonathan Feldstein, and I have the privilege of being your host, coming to you from the Judean mountains here in Israel. I like to refer to it as the original Bible Belt. Inspiration from Zion is a program of the Genesis 123 Foundation, whose mission is to build bridges between Jews and Christians and Christians with Israel in ways that are new, unique, and meaningful. I pray that you will find this, all of those. Through this program, we're excited to connect you to people and stories in and relating to Israel to give you a window to look through, experiencing aspects of life here that you might not otherwise know about. We want this to be interactive, so please be in touch with us at inspirationfromzion at gmail.com and send along any questions and any comments about any topic, any time. Or you can reach us at genesis123.co or follow and like Inspiration from Zion on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Stay tuned until the end where we're going to offer you a special opportunity as we always do. And please feel free to share this with others who will also find it of interest. Today, oh, we're, we're definitely setting a record today. I lost count of how many times I've had Elliot Chodoff as a guest on Inspiration from Zion, both the podcast for the last, I think, four years. Uh, yeah, four years. And the yes. pre, uh, precursor to the podcast, our VIP webinar series as well. Um, it's always a pleasure to have uh, Elliot with us. Elliot is a major in the reserves uh, of the IDF. He, he's been serving since um, the 1980s, yeah? And yep. in one capacity or another, has a huge amount of experience. But in addition to his military experience, he's also um, got numerous degrees, is finishing his PhD, uh, at Bar Ilan University, uh, and is a frequent commentator, especially recently since the beginning of the war on I-24 news, but in general on a whole variety of political, military, diplomatic issues and the intersection of these. And I'm very excited. I'm really pleased. Um, I've only listened to a couple of his episodes, but Elliot has his own podcast recently. And I say finally, because I think he's such an important voice. Uh, it's called Conflict Uncovered. And I'll put a link to that here so you can follow Elliot on your own. Today's conversation was very impromptu. And you know, it's hard to have conversations about the war in the midst of the war, knowing that an hour after we have this conversation, anything can change radically uh, in a very serious way. So we're having this conversation on purpose at just about as close to the time that the audio of this podcast will drop for people to listen, but recognizing that a day and a half is a long time in the Middle East and anything could happen. Elliot, thanks for making yourself available so quickly and at the last minute. Um, it's really always, always a pleasure, a, Jonathan. It, likewise, it's a pleasure. And I, I, of course, I'm following our local media, but I always appreciate when you send me your updates because I glean so much. So thank you for that. Um, we thank are you. now, we are now just shy of a year uh, since October seventh, since the since the massacre. Uh, one can say it's the beginning of the war, not the war, the ground operation that we that we uh, as Israel engaged took a few weeks to actually start. Um, uh, yet on the bigger picture, um, it's it, it, of course interesting that we're talking in the month of September with so many milestones from Camp David to, um, well, Black September. Actually, uh, yesterday was the beginning of Black September in uh, 1970 when, when um, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan slaughtered tens of thousands of Palestinian Arabs. And I don't think there were any protests around the world no. yelling uh, from the river to the sea or from the desert to the desert, Palestine will be free and uh, and many other um, significant milestones. Um, but we're a year out almost since whether we whether the war, we want to say the war started a year ago or um, before 1948. What's, can you give kind of an overview of the status, how how this operation, Swords of Iron, has been successful, and then we'll talk about where uh, where it's also not been successful. First of all, let, let me weigh in on the war that didn't start on October seventh. Uh, this phase of it did this this campaign, if you will, and I think that's important terminology, especially in light of the fact that. Uh, American leaders and others talk about ending the war, and we'll be talking about the North, the war with Hamas, the war with right. Hezbollah, 
And I think it, it's very important to understand that they don't want the war to end. They want the Israeli offensive to end. Well said. The war ending for them is the destruction of Israel. So th there's a, a, a terminological conflict here, which, by the way, America is is has a chronic problem with, not just here. It's complicit. Uh, and, well, it's a chronic problem in the sense that, that America goes into these things, and I can give you a long historical list, not just vis-a-vis -vis Israel and, and, and this conflict, uh, thinking that all sides want the same thing, when right. in fact they don't, and very often American mediation or diplomacy fails because of that. And here in this very specific case, you know, end the war, this is not going to be the end of the war if Hamas is still around and Hezbollah are still around. Um, as I said, because their end of the war is the end of Israel. So right. that, that has to be kept in mind. So October 7th is, is this phase. And uh, you asked successes. So let, let me start with the immediate success of October 7th and 8th, following the, the horrific failure of October 7th. 7th. Okay, and, and, and I think it's very important to start there because it, it, it leads us into the rest of this past year. Uh, obviously, the the failure of the morning of the seventh has, has been gone over, and I mean I, I can add details, but I, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Horrific failure, total failure on the part of the IDF uh, as a system, not just an intelligence failure, an operational failure, a doctrinal failure, technological failure, at least not of if not of the technology itself, of the use of technology, uh, failure, 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 failure across the boards. That's how the number now that they're estimating is 6,000 uh, terrorists and hangers-on crossed into Israel. Um, and we know we know the results, the murders, the rapes, the, 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 the kidnappings, etc., as a result of all of that, right. the burnings. Right. However, Israel, and here I'm saying Israel, not the IDF specifically, okay. bounced back very, very quickly within almost no time uh and i and here the when i say not the idf soldiers in the idf officers in the idf reserve officers uh police etc and uh, it's a long list of, of agencies and and operations got in their cars went down got their units organized and went down there were there were cases of uh of officers in the army who couldn't get permission to get helicopters to fly their men in down into the battle zone. They called pilots who they knew personally and asked for personal favors. Wow, it, I didn't it, know that. It, it was, yeah, it's it's one of these classic Israeli <laughs> improv jobs. Yeah, uh, and I always always say we're so terrible at planning. We have to be good at improvisation. <laughs> uh, and I mean the, the the stories of heroism of, of of a few guys here, a few guys there, standing up against dozens and in, in some cases hundreds yes. of, of Hamas Nukba terrorists. Um, that's already only a success in the sense that even though the high command went into shock paralysis, the body, if you will, kept working. It, it responded instinctively. Okay. Excellent. And. The net result of that is that by 24 to 36 hours, depending on how you want to mark sort of the end of the phase, uh, Hamas is totally defeated on this side of the border. Okay. Okay, so let's say by, by 36 hours, by Sunday evening, right, it started at 6.30 Saturday morning, by Sunday evening, there are maybe a straggler or two running around in the bushes, but right. for all intents and purposes, 6,000 came in and zero are left. Good. That's a slight overstatement, but not okay. not a serious one. Okay. Now, when you think about that, uh, 6,000 people is the, the scale of a couple of brigades. Right. And they were to, to wipe them out. Now, granted, some of them got away. They 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 scooted back into Gaza with their with the hostages and with, with whatever... Uh, booty they they looted but the mo for the most part they were killed or captured in Israel and that was that that was amazing in other words as, as a as a response and and of course as the hours go by into Saturday afternoon 
even the institutional paralysis passes. In other words, by by late Saturday, the system is already starting to to yeah. shake off its its shock. Uh, and as I said, by by Sunday, it's essentially over on this side. The the second success was uh, sort of an outcome of that, and that is that already on Saturday, the government um, makes very very quick decisions by late Saturday. Uh, it's agreed we're at war, which is not a trivial point, because right. that also has economic and 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 legal ramifications. Making that declaration, reserves are called up to the tune of some four hundred thousand. Uh, the decision to evacuate the population of the north along the northern border, by the way, a decision that I think uh, was right. For the moment, but it was a bad decision overall, and we're still suffering from that. But that's that, that's a whole discussion in, of, in and of itself. Well, if we, if we um, can come back to it, I'd like to have that conversation. Okay, sure. Um, and that political organizational response, I am virtually certain, deterred Hezbollah yeah. from jumping in on Monday or Tuesday, which yeah. would have happened. In other words, had Israel still been reeling back, fighting, I don't know, 3,000 Hamas terrorists in the Negev, Nasrallah would have jumped in. Um, and and if Israel had, or, or if, if the government had dithered and said, well, you know, we don't know what we're going to do now, and let, let's see, sure. and sure. which is what it did in, in 2006, um, the Olmert government. So, so all of that was positive in that sense. Now, going into the next phase, um, I have my criticism of the way the, the the operation in Gaza was run, but it's it's esoteric. The bottom line is, with all of the fears, and there were some people who expressed extreme fear over the consequences, the military consequences of going into Gaza and fighting uh, a dug in, trained, organized enemy in in a populated urban environment. I mean, just just saying it sends chills up anybody Correct. who's ever. Uh, I, you know, yeah, I, I get that as you articulated it. Yep. Okay. Um, and the fact the fact is, the IDF went in and crushed them, and we're still crushing them. And part of, part of the reason it's taken so long, and I say only part of the reason, is that it's being done in a slow organized methodical fashion and one of the results of that is relatively low israeli casualties um i say relatively low every every soldier who falls is a tragedy um but if you look at the simple numbers that we've lost in in the gaza operation round number about 400 soldiers and we've killed about 20,000 terrorists uh, you, know, you don't need to be Napoleon to figure this one out. Uh, you know the, the lopsided results, given that they that they started the war with some thirty thousand armed terrorists. Right. Um, you know, we basically crushed them, and that's in addition to destroying infrastructure, warehouses, uh, headquarters, et cetera, et cetera, and a, right, and a right. significant oh, part of yeah. of the tunnel network. The um... A compliment, I think, to what you're saying is that while, of course, we can't dismiss one the death of one soldier and and also too many by friendly fire, but the fact that this was a you you can opine, but my son who was who who went in um, shortly after the ground offensive began saying this is you know we were not trained for this he's a paratrooper right. he said we were not trained for this no one was trained for this and so there was a big learning curve and as compared to six months ago i think you know approximately we were waking up still every day and there were reports of one casualty two casualties five casualties a few instances of several and ten uh in one day today thank god we're not waking up to that on maybe one once a week, which shows a whole lot of more operational control and and what you said, the crushing of Hamas. Yes, let, add to that that we have fewer forces operating in there now. Oh, good point. Um, and and they're much weaker, and the 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 um, the intensity of operations has gone down significantly as well. 
Okay, high high intensity operations equals casualties. Now, okay, okay, and 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 that includes uh, I hate the term, but friendly fire casualties too, because you have yeah. just that many more people running around out there, uh, you know, fighting, shooting. yeah, shooting and 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 fighting multiple battles in parallel uh, and in close proximity. Right. Let's put it Excellent. that way. That Excellent. that in the history books are all very neatly marked with arrows. Uh, <laughs> but in reality, there are no lines and arrows out there. Yes. And you know, you spin around and 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 it look it sounds like, and by the way, this is in an urban environment, it's worse than than anything because sound bounces off walls. You can't oh. use hearing as a direction finder. In other words, yeah. your 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 natural sense of oh, it came from there. Uh doesn't work in an urban environment. Wow. wow. Excellent point. Thank you. Uh, let, let, so as it's, long as it's we disorienting. Have this, let, let's take a quick break. Uh, I want to come back and, you know, fast forward to where we are. Um, but also where well, you, you had said also, which we've discussed in the past, some of the criticisms wh where we could have been or should have been, or you, you can play Monday morning quarterback, but let's take uh, okay. half, half a minute break. Okay. Elliot, uh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, no, no, it's fine. The role, and we can go on with uh, the successes. So you know, let let let's please do that. But I I I also I, I mean I really appreciate that because your perspective is so important and unique. But I also remember from early conversations you talking about things we could have done differently, should have done differently, um, and, and I won't put words in your mouth. I'll let you articulate okay. that also. We haven't spoken in a few months, uh, so so maybe some of right. that will be fresh. But what else? What else do we okay. need to look at? Success. We've we've crushed Hamas. About twenty thousand terrorists killed. Relatively low. Ca relatively low. Uh, with a right. big asterisk and, next and, to it. And low civilian casualties. Correct. Despite the world saying that we're committing genocide, genocide. and all that that nonsense. Yeah. Right. What is something else that you can add in there that? Um, uh, and by the way, you mentioned the fact that we're successful there to a degree is held back uh, Hezbollah. Um, sure. Uh, e even Iran, maybe. Iran, for sure. Um, I believe Hezbollah as well today. To, to, they've shifted. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the North. They've shifted their tactics along with Iran um, in part because they couldn't pull off what they had originally planned to pull off. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, again, again, other than the obvious multiple system failures, which some people following know much about and some don't know a lot about, but I think right. you articulated in broad strokes at the beginning, where, where have we failed or do continue to fail? Okay, do you want to lead into that or should I just go? No, go. Please. Okay. Um, look, there were a number of, I think, strategic errors on the um, in the operation in Gaza. And here I, I want to make clear when I say strategic, on the ground, on the battlefield level, I give the forces up through the, the command level, very, very high grades. Nobody's perfect. War doesn't work that way, but very, very high grades. The method of going in, in other words, the order of going in was backwards, first of uh, all. Right, right. Okay, what should have happened in a, from a purely uh, ground strategic perspective is the now renowned Philadelphia corridor, the border with Egypt, and that part of Rafia should have been taken first. Yep. Cutting off supply from Egypt on the one hand and preventing retreat from north to south. In other words, the, the, the direction should have been south to north. Rafia the direction, Khan of, Yunus, the direction of the combat. Of, of, the, of the Israeli assault. Yes. Of the operation. Now, that doesn't preclude doing other things along the way, but if 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 we're thinking of... You know, right hook or left hook, it should have been a left hook. Okay. Swinging from the Egyptian border up in the yes. direction of Ashkelon, if you will. Yes. Uh, along the coast. 
with Israeli forces moving in and digging in along the northern edge of the Strip and driving Hamas into them. It's 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 basically the tac- the tactic is 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 called hammer and anvil, uh, uh-huh. where the drive is the hammer and the anvil is is the, the force that's dug in, and they're caught between between the two basically. One of the reasons that was not done was a decision made by the government to go after Gaza City first because the rockets aimed at Tel Aviv came from Gaza City. Now, we know that Tel Aviv is a very, very sensitive issue. Look, you know, one one Houthi drone into Tel Aviv and we blew up their port. A um, hundred rockets a day in the north, and it's like, oh, just, a, just another routine day. And, 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 and I live in the north. Uh, we have our eight o'clock barrage, and we have our four p.m. barrage, right. and, and there it's like clockwork. It's it it's reminiscent for those who remember uh, Mash, the the scenes of five o'clock Charlie. Every mm-hmm. every day at five o'clock, mm-hmm. one guy comes in, he drops a bomb, except yes. that it's not a joke. Yeah, uh, you know, but but it's really like that. That there's the four o'clock barrage, and and there are times when I'm talking to people say, oh, it's four o'clock. It's going to start any minute now. And sure enough, within 10 minutes, the, the barrage comes in. So yeah. that's, that's routine, but Tel Aviv is different. And, and I have my criticism of that, but the decision to go from North to South was to neutralize that early. And that was largely done. Okay. So I, I, I'm glad you articulated that because that was a point I remember you saying before, uh, not going from, from South to North and capturing the the southern the the the, the portion along the Egyptian border, what what people got all bugged about a few months ago when we were going into uh, English, right. they call it Rafah, and they were all eyes on Ra- and and where where we were, I, I think, very very successful um, in limiting casualties and still are operating successfully. Yes. But when you say that we wanted to hit take Gaza City first because the rockets. Uh, to Tel Aviv from Gaza City, I don't know anything about it, but isn't that a little foolish? Because don't they have rocket? Didn't they have rockets throughout Gaza that could hit Tel Aviv? And just because rockets came from Gaza City, that that uh, is, is is sort of silly. Uh, no, because once the operation began, they became more and more limited, and now they're totally limited to firing rockets that were pre-emplaced. Ah, I see. Okay. 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 In other, in other words, even the ones that were fired yesterday um, were, were from areas that we'd already been in, and people were like, how come they're firing from, you know, from areas that were already conquered? They dug untold numbers of rocket launchers into the ground. Yes. And they are being fired by remote control. Okay. Um, and they don't have to be anywhere near them. They can just decide. Okay, let's let's fire a couple. Now the, the the Tel Aviv ones were bigger. We had a better idea of where they were. I imagine there are still a few around. Okay. okay. Um, but it also meant that, especially in the early stages of the operation, by going into Gaza City first, they were un, unable to move them around with any facility. In other words, they had to rely on only on what they had already dug in, Got and. It. Uh, and that limited the, the the strikes. Just just as you know, in the parallel, a few weeks ago when we took out the six thousand uh, Hezbollah launchers and rockets that, right. in that morning operation, uh, nearly two hundred and fifty rockets fell on the north. Nobody paid attention, but it doesn't mean that Hezbollah doesn't have any more rockets that it can fire at Tel Aviv. Oh, yeah, but none of, of them were ready to fire that morning. I see. Okay, because they they weren't in place where in in the areas that we hit. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. So what? Ben. No. So the, the, there, there was all sorts of decision, the decision making that was made in the south, uh, including the the delay on on going into Rafia. Yeah. We gave them a lot of time to to dig in, to to shift around, to get out of the way, and that was also uh, poor decision making on on, on my, in my opinion. Um, some of it came from American pressure. American pressure is a constant here. The the threat and and, and Biden said it. You know, you can't go into into Rafah and kill another thirty thousand civilians right. when, in fact, we hadn't killed thirty thousand civilians to begin with, or even thirty thousand uh, you know, people perhaps by then. 
Right. And that included at least half were Hamas. Yes. Right. So, you know, there, there was this this imagery mythology similar to the, you know, to the genocide claim mythology uh, that has become the language of discourse in the West and particularly in, in, from the United States. And it took us a long time to to get past that and say, OK, we're going in anyway. And the fact is uh, the civilian casualties were were absolutely minimized as they were all through the operation. Correct. But and, and after Biden yeah. and Kamala Harris and and their military uh, military leaders and their diplomatic people all said you can't go in without you're gonna there'll be a bloodbath and it really wasn't it right. was very correct right uh, but in my opinion a, a bad decision because it ended up costing us in other words having if we had gone in a month earlier or six weeks earlier as planned uh, and here I'm saying even even given the north to south decision yes. from the outset yes. which which I disagreed with. Uh, even there, we we gave them way too much time uh, to prepare, sure. and it would have worked much better had we gone in earlier. So let me ask you a, a follow up to that because you're speaking specifically, I think, from a military perspective, and that's one of your expertise. But you mentioned the constant pressure from the U.S., and you also yes. bring in a good bit of diplomatic and political uh, knowledge and the intertwining of all of these. Even if it was a mistake going into Gaza, into Rafah in the south late and giving them opportunities to entrench, can you make the case at all that it was legitimate from a political or diplomatic perspective? Or was that also invalid? No, it's not invalid. It it, it wasn't a, a black-white decision of right, wrong, good, bad. It was poorly handled, in my opinion, in the sense that, yes, America has to be taken into account. And all those who say, you know, why doesn't Israel just ignore America? It doesn't work that way. The The shells that we're firing today, we didn't have on October 7th. They came Correct. from America. Correct. And we have to be cognizant of that. Um, and American material support has been pretty consistent. There have been a couple of exceptions, but I'll say pretty consistent uh, in terms of Israel's military needs. Diplomatic support has been very, very iffy, wavering, and, and problematic. Uh, but there's a point at which you have to say, look, this is what we're going to do, and do it. And here we have to also remember that historically, America has never supported an Israeli offensive operation ever in history. Okay. It has always condemned them, including the Six-Day War. Yeah, And... Either, either we we buckled as we did at the the outside of the outside of the Yom Kippur War and not launch a preemptive strike, right? And cost us, right? Uh, in in know, order to, to have to, that, in order to have that international support that we had to bleed first. That's right, and we didn't get it anyway. And and in the end, uh, Kissinger said, "Let them bleed," even after the war broke out. Um. <laughs> uh, so. It turns out that doing what America wants doesn't necessarily gain you many points. Okay. And that, again, that doesn't mean ignore. It doesn't mean slap in the face. It means explain your position. It means do what you need to do in, a, in as much of a way as possible that allows, uh, that keeps America in line, in line in the sense of in, in line with us, right? Yes. Um. But either you hand over your security entirely to the United States and stop being a sovereign state, or at one point or another, and, and here, in fact, at a point six weeks later, Israel did it. America screamed bloody murder and didn't do anything about it. Well, what would have happened if we'd done it a month earlier? They would have screamed bloody murder, and they wouldn't have done much about it. Right. So most, let me ask you a, a, another related question, because you're talking about America historically. What do you do? You think that the American um, political diplomatic response would have been a would be or would have been appreciably different if we weren't in an electoral year? Yes. Okay. I don't think there's there's any question that uh, the election is very much part of the administration's thinking. Um. Including up until now, that 
the the attempt to keep everything quiet until November in the North. Um, you know, America doesn't want a regional war, and I understand that that has nothing to do with elections, but it certainly doesn't want one now when it's fighting for, uh, let, let's call it the progressive vote without getting into ethnicities in key states like Michigan uh, and Minnesota. So, yeah, the last thing they need now is, is, is a major outbreak of fighting and more screaming of, you know, look, the Zionists are committing genocide now, not just in Gaza, but also in Lebanon and Iran and, in you know, in Sri Lanka, in, in Hawaii, or whatever. Um, because, hey, if you're going to do a lie, you might as well, you know, go all the way with it. Yeah, and, right. and, you know, we have to cut them off and, and, and all of that. Um, the last thing America needs now is for something like that to, to erupt and actually be, be forced to come to Israel's aid on a strategic level. Because if Iran does get involved, and, and I have my doubts about that, but I'm, I'm not going to say impossible. Okay. Um, America can't allow Iran to, to run roughshod over the Middle East unless it wants to give up, give up the region entirely, especially now with the Iranian connection to Russia. Yes, Right. Uh, that, you know, and in case another... anyone who's listening uh, it does, isn't aware, the U.S. has recently decided that the Iranian uh, supplying of drones to Russia is a is a bad thing. And now I think we're going to we, we the Americans are going to impose some sort of sanctions um, as a result. It's not just drones. It's also ballistic missiles. Ah, well, miss missiles as well. It's kind of funny to me that. Iran, which is not your most sophisticated country, um, is providing Russia, which is, if there are three world powers, Russia is one of them, uh, or should be, and, and that they even need this from Iran. Well, first of all, Russia, Russia has, um, is to, Russia of today is different from the Soviet Union of World War II. Okay, but even then, Russia needed American lend lease to be able to, to for the equipment to stand sure. stand up against the Germans. Uh, Russia's industrial capability is not as great as it's made out to be. They've suffered tremendous losses. I saw a report this morning. They're estimating the death toll in the Russian-Ukraine war at a million. Wow. Uh, that's a big war. That's a serious war. Someone right? might call that a genocide. If it were us. Yeah, they might, but but Israel isn't involved, so it can't be. <laughs> uh, wow, a million people! Wow. Yeah, that's it's a big war. Yeah, and, and a million people means lots of equipment being used up now. And and there, there's another element here as well. There's an Iranian element. Uh, their attack on Israel back in in April yeah. that failed so miserably. Yes. Uh, Many of the things, many of the missiles they launched didn't make it, not because they were intercepted, because they failed. And they've they've gone back to the drawing boards. My estimate is they're giving a giving a bunch of them now to the Russians to test them. Oh, neat! Okay. Under battlefield condition conditions, okay. because if they fail there, no skin off anybody's nose. Yeah. Um. Because the, the, again, these are these are ballistic missiles, not battlefield missiles. So if if the Russians decide to to launch thirty of them at, at Kiev and they don't make it, so they don't make it. Right, and if they land short uh, and kill civilians in in uh, in Ukraine, no one cares. And if they land short, nobody cares. And kill their own people in Russia, also no one cares. So they say they're sorry. If that. Uh, so so there, there's a lot of that going on as well, and America's aware of it. Uh, the Iranian militias are still firing at American troops that are that are stationed in Iraq and Syria, yes. and of course the Houthis you know, taking on the I'm talking about the U.S. and, and naval forces in in the Red Sea and and in in um in the Arabian Sea. Yeah. So Iran is in, and Iran and America are are in a conflict, even if it's not a direct shooting one. So. The last thing America wants is for that to blow up before Election Day. Yeah. And make it look like they're doing it because of Israel. 
So that that's all part of what's been American diplomacy. Um, and on top of that, the, the Americans natural sense of let's end the war, you know, Correct. but if anything Israel does is escalation. And I mean, it's become almost a joke. Uh, it's a bad joke, but a joke. Right. Uh, anybody yeah. fires at Israel, it's routine. If Israel responds, it's escalation. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Um, what year was Obama elected? Uh, 2008? Eight. Eight. So I remember I was in the U.S. on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, happens okay. to be that a team I once upon a time followed was in the Super Bowl, and I was in a hotel and I watched the game mostly for the commercials. And but I was fascinated with the political commercials. And one thing that upset me, I won't we won't we don't need to talk about Obama, but one thing that upset me about the commercial that the Obama campaign ran during the Super Bowl, I don't remember the sequence of the of the way where, where it went, but he said we're gonna pull out our troops and end the war in Iraq. Now, of course, you don't end a war by withdrawing, you end a war by winning. Uh and, and I, I you, end the war, you can end the war by withdrawing, that's called losing. That's called losing. Okay, correct, correct. So I I knew we were in for some trouble then. We, we and that can be another conversation. Elliot, I want to um, take a break again, and then I want to pick up. Uh, we're going to get to the north, but we're going to spend a little time in the south first. Okay. Okay, Elliot. We were just talking about uh, we were just talking about Iran, and Iran, of course, is the. Um, the octopus that's controlling all of the tentacles, the head of the snake. Um, so one of the Israeli commentators I was watching the other day repeated the line that Tehran is the address for all of this. And this week, this week on Sunday, um, we had a, Sunday, yeah, we had a ballistic missile fired from uh, Tehran. Uh, for, excuse me, from Yemen. From Yemen. Yemen, I was going to say it in Hebrew, Taman, uh, from uh -huh. Yemen, and created tremendous havoc with dozens and dozens of towns and cities around central Israel having the air raid sirens go off um, yes. in a panic. In the end, thank God, it well, in the end, there was no injury or casualty, but it the missile penetrated our airspace, and there was a degree of failure in finding tracking it and and shooting it down much before it it could have been um the 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 houthis claimed that it was a um hypersonic missile which we seem to be disputing but regardless right. that was a that was a, a shocker and and this is one of the things going into my introduction while we're speaking today on the 17th and this conversation will go live on the morning of the 19th uh, we don't know yet what our response will be in Yemen, and it could be even more major, and it could draw in a wider uh, conflict. I'm just putting that out there. What Before we go to the north, which is really what I wanted to have the conversation about, what do we need to know about the Houthi Yemenite missile that was fired at us uh, this week and the consequences? Okay, first, first of all, let me um, modify something you said. Iran is certainly the head of the of the octopus, so the head of the snake. Okay. But not everything that's happening is called directly out of Tehran. Fair enough. Good. Good. Okay. In other words, they're they're not they're certainly not giving Sinwar any orders. They don't need to. They don't need to teach Sinwar how to kill Jews. Right. Uh, okay. Now Hezbollah is different. Hezbollah takes its orders from Tehran. Because Hezbollah has its own its own story, so to speak, but Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, the the militias in in Syria and Iraq, they listen to Iran. They certainly take sort of an overall um, direction from them, but they don't need to be told that direction. They they have it already themselves. Sure. Uh, okay. Iran may have a certain restraining effect if it wants in other words if it says don't do this now that right. will probably be listened to but they don't need to tell them do this now they're doing it th themselves sure now okay now that's not 100 percent. there may be times when they do but overall they're doing it themselves the the missile that was fired was a, a large ballistic missile as as we saw and here I'm not I, I wouldn't say the system failed it just didn't succeed as well as as it 
could or should have. Okay. Okay, because it was intercepted, apparently, and that's what made it break up. And here we, we have to start with the distinction between a ballistic missile and the rockets that are being fired out of and the and drones out of out of Lebanon and out of Gaza, less so obviously today. And that is when one of those gets intercepted by the Iron Dome, it essentially disintegrates. Okay. Okay. And pieces fall, and that's why people are told, and pieces of the interceptor fall. As a matter of fact, there's been a lot of damage caused by pieces of interceptor. Correct. Uh, but compared to a, a rocket landing on somebody's home and blowing up, it's much less damage. Yeah. But people are still warned, go into, into your safe rooms, because you don't want to get hit in the head by, by a falling piece. Correct. When you're talking about a ballistic missile, the interception doesn't shatter it. It stops its flight. It breaks up into a, into a number of pieces. We saw some of those during the the original Iranian strike. This is like you know the flying barn silo. Uh, they're they're huge, and when those pieces break up at at whatever altitude and whatever speed, they uh, scatter sure. over a very wide area. Sure. And that can cause damage. It can cause casualties. Less than if. The I don't know what the size of the warhead was on on this particular one, but you know, we're certainly talking hundreds of pounds, if not more, of a I read, warhead. I read that they estimated the warhead on the one that was fired this week was six hundred fifty kilos, and the whole okay, so that's about fifteen hundred pounds, right? And the whole missile weighed uh, seventeen tons because of the fuel required for it. Sure, now, the fuel, I, the, I the, you... the engine. The engine, the fuel, that, and I and I don't know if it's as big as the one that landed in the Dead Sea in April, which I got up close to that was 11 meters long. But that's, I mean, that's huge. You could build a house inside of it. That's what I, I said. It's, it's, it's like a barn silo. Yeah. Um, so when something like that breaks up, even, if, even the engine falling on a house can cause massive huge. damage. Huge. Okay, but a fifteen hundred pound warhead slamming into an apartment building in Tel Aviv. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're in your bomb shelter or not. Is a whole right? Is a whole different ballgame. So it's it was a successful interception on that level, but a truly successful, in other words, one hundred percent success would have been to take it out before it crossed into Israel. Correct. And that apparently failed. Uh, but you know what? That's that's why you have backups. That's why you have multiple layers. Okay, excellent um, perspective. Good, thank you. Okay, my my guess is that they picked it up early, which is why we also know that it wasn't hypersonic. Okay. The decision was made not to alert, not to set off the alerts early, because if it had been taken out, let's say, over Saudi Arabia or over the the Red Sea or something like that, there would have been no need to, to sound alerts in Israel. Got it. When they saw that they couldn't stop it at that point, and then you don't know if you're going to stop. In other words, the, the last the last defense line can fail also. Uh, and and in any event, once it's being stopped over Israel, as we said before, pieces could be flying. You want everybody Correct. in a very wide area to be in, in safe rooms. They set set off the alerts. What was a minute and a half before before impact? Uh, which everybody in the center thought was, you know, was very panicky. Uh, sorry, we're on 30 seconds and 15 seconds and, and zero up here in the north. I right. mean, you know, I, can have, I can have a cup of coffee and still get into my, my safe room. We joke about it, but you know, it's gallows humor. But it, it was done, I think, in the best way possible. Under the circumstances, and and here again, I don't I don't criticize a multi layered system when the first layer didn't didn't succeed. Okay, excellent. What do you think the consequence of this is going to be? It, it, it wasn't a it wasn't a drone that was flown uh, right. more than a thousand miles, more than fifteen hundred miles, and actually landed and struck Tel Aviv and killed some killed one and, and injured several. This was uh, it was uh, okay a failure, um, but it was a but it was a big failure. Um, sure. What do you think the consequences are going to be? We we had a pretty strong personal, response the last time. It's my personal strategic belief that any attack 
on us and whoever the us is in this case israel but an attack on us should be responded to as if it succeeds whether it succeeds or not okay good okay now that's not how the world sees it the world says well you know no blood no foul right uh but we'll see whether the government and and now now we're getting again into higher strategy uh do we go to yemen with another major strike and my guess is that if we do it's not going to happen uh well it didn't happen immediately now we're, in, we're we are now in that time frame where it's no longer immediate and it could happen at any time on the other hand it could be could be put off for a week it could be put off for two weeks um but put into the mix if the north is about to erupt and if the americans and we know the americans are desperately pressuring us not to do anything in the north uh is this the time you want to poke things by going after yemen okay here 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 i would put the diplomatic step forward because the houthis are not the primary threat and here here i think the hierarchy is okay. is much clearer okay um you know, it's 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 not it's not about do we escalate in Rafiah or not escalate. It's do we deal with Hezbollah on the north or not? And here I would say keep our eye on the ball, uh, and and the ball is Hezbollah. Okay. Now, so, yeah, go ahead. So I want to talk about that because that is you know, that's it's, our... a, it's possible that you know the government will see it differently, but that that's how I would look at. It. Well, what we're seeing in the media this week since the uh, Houthi missile attack. Um, what we're seeing is, yes, there may be also by the time people are listening to this conversation, we may have a new defense minister. We may have a response in uh, in, in in Yemen, um, but we also may be an all out war. I know you said that we already are in war, but but a full and we're seeing right, that escalate. Right. right. And a, a complete escalation. We're talking about whether or not there should be a preemptive attack, what that might look like. And that, and now the the government has officially added to the um, objectives of this war that the northern residents should be uh, who have been evacuated by the by by about a hundred thousand uh, need to be able to go back, and that means crushing Hezbollah and and moving them yes. moving them way back past the Latani River and their tremendous infrastructure that they have. So what? First of all, as you said before, you live in the north. Are you seeing anything different? You referred to a hundred missiles being fired a day, rockets being fired a day, and that's pretty standard. It's it's escalating. It's escalating um, incrementally because Hezbollah wants to cause as much damage as possible and receive as little as possible in return. Right. And incremental um, escalation <laughs> is puts you in what. I call the 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 auction the auctioneer mode. In other words, you've bid twenty thousand dollars and they just raised it to to twenty thousand five hundred. Are you going to let it get away for five hundred dollars? <laughs> uh, they you know they fired sixty rockets yesterday and they fired seventy today. You're going to go to war over ten rockets. Mm. Mm. And by the way, the first example of this technique is biblical where when abraham is negotiating with god over sodom and gomorrah ah very nice and it's interesting i mean it's not surprising that god doesn't fall for it but it's interesting <laughs> that the text shows that abraham tried to pull it he says yeah. if there are 50 will you destroy it for you? i'm paraphrasing right and god says no i will not destroy it for the 50. He says, well, if there are 45, will you destroy it for the five? Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. And, you know, because five because only five are missing. And God says, no, I will not destroy it for the 45. In other words, he doesn't get into Abraham's discourse. Excellent. Wow. Good, good insight, Elliot. Okay, but but Abraham tries it. Um, so this is not a new technique. Okay, very nice. But so we're Where? seeing. So now we're seeing. Yeah, now we're seeing incremental es escalation. The numbers are increasing. There, um, there's a qualitative escalation as well. I'll give you an example. Uh, late Saturday night, 
at about 1 a.m. They launched a bunch of missiles, a bunch of rockets at the Tzfat area. Why? What happened Saturday night around 1 a.m.? The Slichot prayers oh, okay. of the month before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Okay. The, right, the prayers of forgiveness okay. that start okay. the, that people go at midnight. It's a a, a, a Jewish know. a Jewish uh, what's her name concert. Um, the, the one who ugh, wow, I can't even remember her name. The one that we're going to be a terror attack in uh, in Austria, Brit not Britney Spears, the other one. Okay. Um, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Yeah. So it was our it was our version of a Taylor Swift concert. So they're trying to attack. Our concert. Okay. Good. I mean, the, in other words, they know what's going on. They typically fire, by the way, on Saturday mornings around 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. And 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 as Shabbat's starting. And as Shabbat is starting, exactly. Uh, so th this is... Th the, the Saturday night one was part of an escalation. Got it. Firing okay. more into areas that are not evacuated. And, and, right. and we've created... Right, we've created a new wacky terminology um, in in the, in the in the news report. Rockets were fired into non-evacuated areas. Ah, yes, good good comment. Right. Okay. Right. In other words, evacuators is the norm. Non-evacuated, really. Uh, but by doing that, they know that they're increasing the chances of civilian casualties. Correct. And and uh, the consequence of that. Well, obviously, and the consequence. Right. So so there are many escalations going on and we're, we're seeing it that are not necessarily numerical, although we're seeing okay. more and more rockets. That's also incremental. But we're seeing a qualitative escalation. Uh, rockets are falling around the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. Also, non okay. non evacuated area, and and sig while and, it's not so far from the Lebanese border, it's significantly further from where the dozens are typically in the northern uh, panhandle, if you will, or the finger of the Galilee. Yes, and that that's almost at the latitude that I live at. Right. Correct. Correct. Okay. Have you had sirens? I don't see it on my. We, we have not had. We had two early on. We've not had sirens. We hear them in the distance. I I hear the. I see the interceptions. Okay. Uh, not all of them, obviously. I see some of them. I hear the I hear the interceptions. I hear our artillery fire outgoing, uh, which is a lot nicer than incoming. Indeed. Um, but in, in other words, we're we're we we have we we live the 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 normal life of my my son coming in and saying, "I hear beams," and. You know, explain to a, a four and a half year old that you know booms is you know normal background noise, right? Well, well right. Welcome to your life. Um, I mean, I, there are planes going overhead right now. Okay, I I notice it uh, more uh, recently. I was away for a while, but recently I've been hearing a lot. Even we're forty miles from Gaza, and I hear sometimes very loud. Um, and and constant planes overhead, which means I assume that means that uh, planes are flying in from the Mediterranean, bombing wherever they need to bomb, and then just have to do a wide sweep to the east in order to come back and land or or fire again. Uh, look, it also it depends on the number of planes in the air because they have to vector them. Uh, okay. You know, but that that morning when we took out the the six thousand launchers and rockets, there were a hundred. Fighter, a uh, hundred rock combat planes over Lebanon. That, in and of itself, is an air traffic controller nightmare. Sure is. Good, I'm right? This, you, these, you know, these are not these are not airliners lining up for landing at at Kennedy, where you have prearranged, you know, Slots stacks. And, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Uh, That's a very very good point. And that nothing happened other than the successful destruction of six thousand. Right. Elliot, let's take one last break and then come back. Uh, come back to the north because this is this is where everyone's eyes are. Not on Rafah anymore, right. but on on Hezbollah and Lebanon. Yes. One more one more quick break. Okay, so you you alluded to it. I I I meant to write down. I should have because you said it very well. 
but all of the media is talking about the inevitability. And I'm wondering, is it uh, of this escalation? And, and before we talk about what that will look like, do you think it's truly inevitable now? Or is this just another crying wolf? Is it, are we are we worried? Is, the, is that a political bluff to say, hey, we're we're ready and then to pull them back from the north to say, no, we're not, we're, we don't want this yet. Look, first of all, nothing is inevitable. Okay. Right. It, I mean, it, it's all the result of decision-making. Earthquakes are inevitable. Okay. Those are started by decision and it may be the right decision. Don't, don't misunderstand me, but it's decision. Okay. So there are a number of, prerequisite concepts. Does Israel want to return 100,000 internal refugees to the northern border? If the answer is yes, if Hezbollah continues to exist, that is not going to happen. And by exist, I mean in the frame that it is now. Will Hezbollah back down? It could. I don't think it will. If I had to put money on it, I would bet heavily against. Uh, but it, it could. Will American pressure move Hezbollah? Categorically, no. 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 Will American pressure affect Israeli decision-making? Possibly. Now, the Americans on this, as in many of these subjects, are completely off base. Uh, the, the, the best line I saw the last couple of days, an unnamed uh, administration source saying, well, in the end, Israel and Hezbollah are going to have to make a deal anyway, so they might as well do it without a war. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Uh, and it's like, do you not understand? Because the Americans think this is all about a territorial dispute over three spots along the Lebanese border. Right. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because recently the Americans floated the idea of a territorial exchange as, as if that was going to stop Hezbollah. That's it. From That's what it's all about, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, let's not pay any attention to what Nasrallah says and has written. Let's pay no attention to what Naim Qasim, who's their number two and has been for decades, says. Let's pay no attention to Khomeini and his philosophy. And here that's, that's significant because Nasrallah is a student of Khomeini. He okay. studied at the Khomeini school. Uh. Um, we're talking about not just anti-Israel, but anti-Jewish. Yes. You know, Nasrallah a few years ago said, we support all the Jews moving to Israel. It'll make it easier to kill them all. We won't have to track them down around the world. There you go. So yeah, it's about the occupation, right? Sure it is. Yes. Um, so in what world do the, does anybody believe that America can come in and work out some sort of a, a deal that is going to do anything other than put a bandaid on this enormous eruption? And most importantly, and I come back to this and, and, and I've said it in, in, in interviews over the past few months. The ultimate decision makers over whether the North is secure or not are the residents who have to go back there. Correct. Or, and if or they don't will, feel secure, will go back there or even will well, consider it. That's my point. In other words, if they go back, then they will have made the decision. If they don't see security there, they're not going back. And, and let's remember, many of these people don't have homes to go back to. The town of Matula doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's, it's ruins. There are a couple of other kibbutzim and moshavim that are very close to that. Mm. Uh, forests have burned. Yeah, nature reserves have burned. You know, people have been to Caesarea Philippi. It does. It's not the the ruin. The ruins are there, but the nature reserve is gone. It's burned to the ground. Um. So, this idea that okay, well, Hezbollah will agree to be good boys from now on, doesn't cut it. And I'm not convinced they'd agree to that, but let's say they do. And let's also keep in mind, historically, Hezbollah, Hezbollah doesn't violate agreements. It ignores them. Right. 
with, with with complicity from the rest of the world, like the UN resolution in in two thousand six, and that that's right. that was never never even uh, attempted to be implemented, and that's why they're in this position that they're in. That's right, right. The UN resolution, the Taif Agreement in in Lebanon. There there have been many. Now. Keep in mind also that the numbers that America is talking about are nonsensical. America talks about moving Hezbollah 10 kilometers back from the border. Oh, yeah, right. That's ridiculous. So first of all, the anti-tank missiles that they're using to destroy our northern towns, the Cornet, have a range of 10 kilometers. Yeah. In other words, America says we're going to move them back, and they will still be within anti-tank range of the Israeli border. Correct. And all That's of the missiles one. that can hit all of Israel can, all over the place. Hit, can hit from 10 and 20 and 30 kilometers back. Exactly. And, and, right. So it means nothing. Now, on top of that, they have created a massive infrastructure of tunnels, of networks in the south. And their assault force, Rejwan, named after Imad, Imad Mornia, by the way, one of the guys who was oh. responsible for the Marine barracks bombing, the embassy bombings back sure. in the 80s, who, who we sent on, off to a better place uh, <laughs> in Damascus about 15 years ago. Um, so their purpose is to do to northern Israel what Hamas did to the south on October 7th. That, that's, that's what they do for a living. Yeah. So we're going to pull, they're going to pull them back 10 kilometers. Now, I don't know about you. I, I'm not as fast as I used to be, but I can walk 10 kilometers in, in two and a half hours. Walk. Yes. So 10, 10 kilometers, for those who are still scoring in America, that's six miles. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you move them back 10 kilometers. How long will it take for them to, to infiltrate back to the border? And then what? Right. Then Israel's in an even worse position, because now if Israel attacks them, it will be in violation of the agreement. Uh, very nice. Good. Good. Okay. Oh, oh, they violated it first? That's not a reason to start a war. Right. That's escalation. Right. Just having more Lebanese people in southern Lebanon is not an escalation, um, even if they're carrying anti-tank uh, missiles. Right. But, or or like, whatever. What what do we need so to I, be looking for this week? Go ahead, finish finish what you're saying. No, so so I think that there was a long way around. The conclusion is it's not inevitable. But if if Israel doesn't want to simply cede control of northern Israel to Hezbollah, because that's what we've done up until now, not not management control. They're not here, but they're controlling our lives. Absolutely. Okay, so if Israel decides to do that. Uh, Israel has essentially ceded sovereignty to a terrorist organization. Because if you can't protect your territory and you can't protect your citizens, what what reason is there to have the state? So what is driving the media now on a pretty consistent basis here to be saying that this that this is inevitable, that the government has now uh, put the re returning northern evacu evacuees back to their places. Is this is this American politics? Is this Israeli politics? Is this the weather coming, uh, changing, yes. and, and rain in November, which will make it hard to impossible yes. to engage them? Is this all of the above? Did I miss a few? Okay. You missed you missed a couple, but first of all, yes, all of the above. By the way, it rained this morning here. Okay, which is unusual. Um, it's early. It's early, but it wasn't the heavy rain. But it's it's coming, okay. and you you can feel it in the air. Yeah. Um. So yes, the time frame matters. Politics matters. The pressure of the population matters. Let, let's let's be clear. I, I don't know how many of them would vote for the government anyway, but if elections were held tomorrow, I don't see anybody who's been evacuated who's living somewhere else voting we could. Right. Or probably not be well, maybe yes, but certainly not we could. No, I usually could as as you know as a euphemism for any anybody associated with this. Right. Okay. 
there's another factor that needs to be added to that, and that is we are we are winding down operation scale in Gaza. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that the war with Hamas is over, but it means that if we went in the in the maneuver with five divisions in a full blast ground offensive against some 27, 28 battalions of Hamas, we're now hanging out in there with a couple of divisions that are under strength, or at least one of them is under strength, one of them is full strength, um, because we don't need more than that. We've we've destroyed all but maybe one or two of their battalions. Uh, the efficiency, the effectiveness of the forces has gone up. In other words, five five divisions may have been too much force even in November. Oh, okay. Okay. But better to have more than you need than less than you need. Yes. Okay. Uh, now the calibration is 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 much finer. Uh, the, the 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 method of operation is different, and here also very important. With the winding down of high intensity, and we've gone now to counterinsurgency, which has its own sort of you know, context. The need for massive artillery support has declined. The need for massive air support has declined, and that can be shifted northward as well. Got it. Some of it has been already. Okay, you certainly don't want a situation where you have two major events happening on the battlefield in two different places, and now you've got to figure out where do you assign your support assets. Got it. Okay. So so that's that's another thing that's pushing toward now or the immediate future that wasn't there, let's say, two or three months ago. Sure. And also because at any point Hezbollah with, with Iranian instructions or or allowance um could unleash their 150,000 i know you said uh could be 300 350,000 rockets and missiles that they have on us and they don't and and that's not weather related and they can do Correct. even if even if only uh 10% get through and they fire a few thousand a day and we can knock knock them out it certainly precludes our going in effectively with a ground operation to stop it Right. Well, I, I think a grand operation will start with heavy air and artillery strikes. Okay. Um, now that doesn't mean the ground forces won't move relatively quickly, but m massive movement will follow. Will be will will be preceded by. It's hard for me to estimate, but twenty four hours at least would be my estimate uh, of of air and artillery, both for tactical and strategic reasons, taking out as we did in 06. Uh, take out as many of the long-range missiles yeah. as we possibly can, uh, do as much damage to, to their launch capability. And we've been doing that, by the way. We, we have degraded their capability over the past year. Yes. But uh, if my numbers, estimates are, are anywhere near correct, so we've degraded from 300, 350,000 to what? 150,000? Right. You know, and, it's and still and massive. Still if, and still, if they fire a few thousand a day... For the first few weeks of the war and 10 percent of the few thousand a day get through that's massive casualties on damage end. yes yeah. yes what would you do elliot what would you do if you're uh, chief of staff and and defense minister and prime minister um i would have gone in already okay but i i would go in yesterday okay uh i won't go into here i i happen to be proved privy to some of the the battlefield plan, so I won't go into okay. the, the how or what, but no secret, uh, not a military secret, as, as I said before, that uh, preceding it with, first of all, defanging as much of their missile capability to do heavy damage as much as possible and as quickly as possible, uh, and then movement on the ground in a series of phases, I'm not going to say more than that, uh, some of which we might see very, very quickly, and some delayed for 24, 48 hours to get everything lined up and 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 moving in the right in the right directions. And decisions made on you know on the spot because ultimately we're talking about an, uh, an enemy that is that's capable of moving where the where the precise punch, if you will, has to go is not about territory; it's about enemy force. 
In other words, we're, we're not trying to take resources that are fixed in a, in a particular location. We're trying to destroy an enemy, and, and their ground is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. Let me ask you a question. If, um, if we know where Hassan Nasrallah is, albeit buried in Beirut under a lot of civilians, and we're going to have this all-out war and escalation anyway, would this not be the right time to take him out? I think or that if, if we can get it... First of all, it matter, It always matters. Um, here, here, I, I, it, again, a whole subject in and of itself, but it, it, it's kind of the postscript to taking out Hania, taking out Shukr, taking out Soleimani in his day on in the Trump administration, uh, and all the leaders that, that we're knocking off. And we, we took out an Islamic Jihad guy last night in, in Gaza, uh, the head of their rocket system in Rafiq. You think it's important to understand, first of all, taking out their leadership is not a long-term solution to the problem, but it is a short-term effective solution. And here's a contrast. And I see this in, in literature and I, I shake my head. These are organizations, they are not standard military institutions. So let's... The contrast here is very important. A number of colonels were killed on October 7th, Israeli colonels. Uh, again, personal tragedy, not going to go into that, but in an Israel, in the Israeli military, as in any military organization, the U.S. military, a person serves in a position for a number of years, three years, five years, whatever it is, different military, different periods, right. and then they move on. I, I, I say... Half jokingly, just as they get really good at their jobs, they get promoted. <laughs> okay. And then somebody else comes in. And they move either laterally to gain some more experience before they're promoted. I'm being positive, you know, assuming this is that everyone's moving up, which they're not obvious. If that person, that colonel, that brigade commander is killed, first of all, he's got a deputy who is one rank below him, but has almost as much experience as right. he does. Right. There, there are a bunch of other colonels who, including the guy who he just replaced in the last couple of years, uh, but others along the way, waiting assignment, whatever, who can yes. be moved in. Now, obviously, there are some people who are better than others, but overall, in terms of qualification, background, experience, they're all pretty much the same. Okay. In these organizations, you don't have that. When we took out Fuad Shukr, he had been the head of the military. They call him the chief of staff. He's not, he was under Nasrallah, but let's say for our purposes, he had been the number one in Hezbollah since 2009. Okay, very good. Very and good. number two under Mourinho since 1982. Wow. Okay. 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 So it's much more significant. When, much more significant in terms of background knowledge and the the difficulty in replacing him over the short term. When we took out Muhammad Def, the the one of the mili military, one of the violent chiefs of Hamas, we had taken out his deputy four months earlier, but he had been in his position for decades. Right. So here you're taking out key individuals right. whose personality, that whose personal position is far more important than sort of the title on that. And the same same here is true with Nasrallah. Nasrallah has been head of Hezbollah for over two decades. So what would you do? What, what would make you hesitate if this is going all out anyway to take him out? I, Even if he's underneath the hospital and it means a thousand people die. Okay, so there, there you have to you, you have to balance that. In two thousand six, we dropped the building on him. He walked. He he crawled out from oh, under it. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, but no, you know, if, if he's in a hospital and you have to kill a thousand civilians to do it, it may not be worth it. It may not be worth it for for grand strategic reasons. Um, keeping him under threat certainly is worth it, and we we see this with Sinwar. You know. He, Nasrallah is still sitting very comfortably because we're not blowing Beirut to, to smithereens. Right. But how 
how much is Sinwar in immediate total control of his organization? I'm not convinced. You know, he's there, he's making decisions, uh, but he's operating entirely by handwritten notes being Correct. run in and out by by runners. Correct. Uh, so that, that counts too, that kind of pressure. Okay. Obviously, I'd much rather see him taken out. Uh, Nasrallah is still plugged in. If he needs to move to some place that's less convenient, then that also has strategic okay. positive advantage. Good to know. Okay, um, Elliot, we've gone way into overtime. I appreciate it. Yes. I enjoy it, and I appreciate it. And I know everyone following does. Let me just ask you, uh, we, we've spoken over the last number of months about individual needs. You've you've done some stuff to provide things for soldiers. I've done some stuff to provide things for soldiers. Right. I, I just want to ask you kind of on the, especially I know I'm not the only one, but we're, we're experiencing somewhat donor fatigue. People want to support, but th it's been a year and, right. and, and there's a lot of stuff that still needs support. But if there's an escalation tomorrow, the next week, whenever, whenever that happens, what, what should, could you estimate that will be the specific needs for our troops? Obviously, we're not providing weapons, neither you nor myself. No, uh, no. well, what would, no. What would, be, <laughs> what would be the need? Uh, my anticipated need, if this goes into the winter, will be winter equipment. Okay. And um, here again, I, I don't want to launch into a whole lecture, but the, the winter needs of the North here in Israel are very different from the American concept of winter. Okay, and I'm, I would actually argue that the weather that we have in our winter is more dangerous in the field than the Arctic cold of central northern United States. Right. Uh, because when it's that freezing cold, you know you're cold. When it's 45 degrees and rainy, you can kid yourself into thinking that you're okay, and that's when hypothermia becomes even more serious. Sure. Good point. Uh, but here, I, I mentioned it. I, I would only caution that there's a lot of, um, how can I put this, low-quality stuff out there that's um, that's even more dangerous than not having it. Yeah. So I think if and when the, the time comes, I'll be happy to consult with you on it and uh, what I've done in particular, and I'm I'm still doing, is that I'm in, I'm in touch specifically with units. Uh, in other words, rather than simply collect stuff and bring it, I speak to the units and and discuss with them what they need. In Good. some cases, advise them what they need. Good. But then then we can go, you know, fill fill that that gap okay. uh, very very specifically. Okay. To be continued. I I already thought that whether there's the escalation or not. We're still going to be having a massive number of troops, and um, and and I know last year, since the war began, we we raised money and provided uh, somewhere in the range of twelve hundred uh, winter jackets to soldiers, right. and and they boy, and it was cold. I remember being up there on Christmas Eve last year, giving out the first jackets. Um, in it's the nasty. Line. It's and and it it ripped through me. It was, yeah. and I'm from New Jersey. I'm 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 used to cold weather. Um, right. yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, it's nasty. Uh, thank you for that. Elliot, as always, um, wow, so much to digest. And I really, really appreciate the time, not just all of the time, but also making time today, really at the last minute. Um, anything always a pleasure. Before I wrap up, anything that you just want to, that we didn't cover, we want to add, or we'll come back? Well, a lot we didn't cover, but I I, I think we so covered much. enough for today. So much. Okay. So thank okay. you again, Elliot, uh, Major Elliot Chodoff. Uh, political commentator, host of the Conflict Uncovered uh, podcast, which are going to provide the information so you can follow and, and frequent commentator on I-24. Um, as people know, who have been following inspiration from Zion for the last three years, and especially in the last year, it's exactly a year this week, um, we have been offering uh, a gift for people just to comment, like, and share the uh, link to this episode, and we want to encourage you to do that. Um, our program is called From Jonathan's Bookshelf, and until a year ago, we were offering other people's books, but since literally a year this week, our book, uh, Israel the Miracle, rolled off the presses. Um, we've sold, wow, thousands of copies. 
which has been a blessing and we still have a few left. So we are offering every month, all you need to do is like, comment or share the link to this and we will pick one person at random to receive a copy. And I would love to be able to give a copy to you. We're always grateful that this podcast is sponsored by our friends at the Willow Run Greenhouse in Culpeper, Virginia. And I always say, if you're ever in the area, swing by and thank them for helping making conversations like this possible. And also our dear friends, the Coin family for their meaningful support. Inspiration from Zion and all Genesis 123 Foundation programs, especially our Israel emergency campaign, are made possible by donations. So please consider joining us to help continue the dialogue and building bridges. Now, as the host, I have the prerogative and privilege sometimes to uh, select um, who who a particular episode is sponsored in honor or, or or in certain cases in memory of. And this week has been a monumentous week for me. I had my fourth grandson born and my youngest son was just inducted last night into the IDF as the uh, outstanding soldier in his unit. So I pr I'm taking pride in my family this week and uh, like to share that and sponsor this in honor of my new grandson whose name we don't know yet and my son Yishai who is beginning his three year military career. If you would like to sponsor a future episode in honor, memory, a loved one or special occasion or your favorite IDF soldier, uh, including reservist major Elliot Chodoff, uh, please be in touch at inspirationfromzion at gmail.com. We always love to hear your comments as part of a dialogue and invite you to send any questions anytime, especially about traditional Judaism for our Ask the Rabbi programs. Please do share this with others who will also find it of interest and please continue to join us right here where you'll find meaningful conversations about topics relating to Israel that you won't hear anywhere else. Wherever you are in the world, I pray that you and your loved ones are all safe and healthy. And I send my blessings from the Judean mountains. God bless you.